Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast. We have a tremendous guest with us today, Thomas France, actually from France, a co-founder of the Ledger Wallet. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, can you, can you tell us a little bit about like how you got into uh, Bitcoin just in the very beginning? Yeah, so we came into Bitcoin quite quite late in a way. If it was in 2013, we were working in a different uh, payment startup at the time, and we actually sold our companies in December 2013. At the time, the price was hitting I think uh, one thousand dollars, and we had some time, we had some money, we had some energy, and some time to to spend on new projects. And we kind of uh, went on the the Bitcoin uh, train at this time, and um, we started working on the uh, Bitcoin space in France to kind of uh, iterate on the different projects. So we launched like a co-working space around Bitcoin. We made the, put the first uh, French ATM over there. We worked on different projects, and we kind of tried to gather the team to launch great projects out of France. And uh, that's how we came up after a few months with uh, Ledger Wallet, which is a hardware wallet based on the smart card. Yeah, so this is very interesting. It's, it's a hardware wallet. It's based on the smart card technology. Can you explore that a little bit? Like, what, what do we mean by this smart card technology? Because not necessarily everybody in the U.S. is familiar with this. Yeah, exactly. Well, smart cards is the, um, the little chip that you have, like, on the, on the new generation of credit cards. You might, uh, you might receive a new one in the, few, in the coming weeks, and you will see this little thing that looks like a SIM card. And it's actually a smart card that has been present in credit cards for, like, 20 or 30 years in France and Europe and they have been like securing credit card transaction in a very efficient way. In the US it was just like magnetic stripes and there was like all these uh, targets uh, breach and um, scandals of, uh, of uh, Russian hackers getting credit card numbers and with the smart cards you don't have this issue because um, the private credential are stored on the secure environment and the signature of the transaction are made there. And for Bitcoin, it was actually um, uh, something that you could leverage that technology uh, because it has been uh, used and used and tested and hacked for many years. And you could use that technology for Bitcoin to store private keys, to sign transactions, and to really have a layer of security for, for Bitcoin. Now, when you say it's in a secure environment, what do you mean by that? Is it in compliance when it, with any particular uh, standards that are out there? Yeah, it's, it, there's a lot of standards in that smart card industry. There's like banking standards so that the information stored in it cannot leak. Uh, it's uh, in standards so that the code that runs on that secure microcontroller uh, cannot be tempered, that they act against a definite specification. So it's, it's really like um, built on a strong know-how and certification history that was made to secure like credit card transaction. It's also what secures basically like passport information when you see a little SIM on your passport, it's the same kind of thing. So it has been designed not to leak secrets and to run tamper-proof code. Where are the actual private keys stored at? Because I think with some of the other hardware wallets that are out there, the private keys might actually be stored in the RAM, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, where are they? Like, where are the the private keys actually stored, like on the Ledger wallet? Yeah, it's really a, if you have a look at the Ledger wallet, it looks like a smart card. Uh, it looks like a USB key. But instead of having like a USB, it's, it's like a SIM card. And basically, within that, there's a very tiny, like one millimeter on one millimeter microcontroller. And that's where the private keys are stored, basically. When you say you can't tamper with 
uh, that microcontroller at all? Like, like, why can't that be tampered with? Well, it it is designed in a way, so it's uh, designed with layers of uh, hardware, of, uh, physically designed with layers of hardware and software, so that it has some mechanism, so that if malwares are coming in and try to change the code, it will disable itself. It has a certain amount of physical and software uh, mechanism to protect against uh, this kind of malware altering the code. Does that have to do with the EAL 5 Plus uh, certified smart yeah, uh, the, environment? The, or these, smart are some, these are some uh, parts of the standards and certification that those kind of secure elements have to go through to be used by a uh, banking system. And these are the kind of certification you have to do that. So when we have different individuals and companies in the Bitcoin ecosystem that are, you know, like trying to make their Trezor wallet or trying to make the Case wallet or whatever, we've already got standards, you're saying, for securing this type of information. Mm -hmm. We just need to apply those standards. And you've applied those standards with the Ledger wallet. Exactly. That's what we do. After... People have different approaches, and there's some different approaches that needs to be tested, and we'll see which one uh, get the best thing. So I guess, uh, yeah, we think that uh, a lot of work has been done by uh, by other industry to show these kind of standards. So we basically don't want to reinvent the wheel and take uh, uh, the best that already exists and apply it for Bitcoin. Yeah. Do you think that the development of standards that might even be cryptocurrency or Bitcoin specific are going to be important to? Uh, develop out as an industry and if so like why do you think that would be definitely there's a need to have some good practice in the, in that industry uh, regarding uh, security for example if we take that so you already have some uh, standards that are starting to to work out uh, to begin with c4 for example and uh, so yeah they, they will need to be some those kind of certification uh, more and more uh, it's still the beginning of an industry so at the beginning uh, changes were not using multi-sig now they will be using more and more multi-sig they will be using some hardware security module to be having some uh, some secure elements within their servers to be sure that uh, the transactions are signed properly and there's no risk. So there will be more and more new methods to secure that. So and they will need to some standards to have uh, to, to to specify all that for sure. Yeah. So you mentioned C4, and I like the work that Michael Perklin and Mike Belshi from Bitco and John Belisarios from Armory have been doing over there. Uh, you know, looking at Armory specifically, uh, John Velasarios comes from Accenture, where he would uh, actually lead key ge- generation ceremonies and do other work with tier one financial institutions. And one of the critical parts in that is designing the entire policies and procedures around it, but also like making sure that the hardware component in the process is in place. So the Ledger wallet, is it of the particular security standards that these enterprise level tier one financial institutions could actually use in designing a Bitcoin strategy or a Bitcoin plan for, you know, operating at the highest levels of finance? Definitely something that uh, that we, we, we can uh, we can provide. And, and today our our basically develop an OS that runs on secured environment, secured piece of hardware. Today we demonstrated it could work on a, on a, on a smart card, but we just deployed that, that uh, same OS within a trusted execution environment in a very uh, little time because it's very portable, and we could apply that also for hardware security modules directly in bank. So. All this uh, OS, these APIs that we've developed for the Ledger Wallet can actually be used for um, HSM uh, security to, to, to secure the backend of, uh, of this financial institution, as well as directly within trusted execution environment to secure like people using their mobile phone directly. So let's delve in a little bit more on, on these HSMs or these hardware security modules. Uh, what type of work have you been doing in that area? So basically, uh, it's a preliminary work. So um, on, uh, on uh, some of our, the founders of our company have already been working on HSM many times and uh, HSM integration for banks. So today we're we're still looking for people to to work out and and test some uh, some uh, cheap uh, HSM solution to to do that. And it's something that could be done very easily in a couple of weeks, month to be uh, designing that for one of the partners. You know, you can't be around Bitcoin without having a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, switching gears a little bit, 
Do you have a particular story that uh, or two that just kind of illustrates where you, you've had a lot of fun in this industry? Let's say that the relationship with the banks were like a fun story when we started uh, uh, working in the Bitcoin space. Um, we had so many issues. It was... Uh, Funny to, to see the bank, funny to see bank accounts close and see, <laughs> see that people were just like uh, considering us like just like, um, crypto anarchists so from day one and that we wanted to kill the bank. So well, it was quite actually good fun to meet these people who were, um, kind of afraid of what we were doing, not understanding what we we're doing and in the meantime trying to fight against us. So yeah, it was not actually a fun thing, but <laughs> so how? I mean, how did that resolve itself? I think the one of the French courts uh, ruled that the bank had to keep the Mount Gox bank account open because I guess like in France, bank accounts are more like public utilities, and you can't just arbitrarily deny service or something. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, how did all this kind of play out? Getting oh. your bank account shut down because yeah, they no, think you're like some crazy no, uh, it's, it's Bitcoiner. Ba- it's basically a, the, the the only problem was more like uh, about cash handling because we were uh, operating an ATM, so it's like a. Uh, when you have too much money at one stage, uh, the bank can decide, say, no, you, you deal with Bitcoin. I don't want to deal with Bitcoin, so let's just close your account. Sorry about that. I'm sure you will find somebody else. So um, just about finding the right partner, explaining them, and, and, and picking actually the right one that's ready to uh, to, to kind of um, and continue with you because they know that uh, you're not doing that because uh, because you have a bit of... You do your own KYC and you're not just like crazy... So uh, as long as uh, as people understand that you are uh, like a long term business, get better with them. And for exchanges, you were mentioning this uh, court that uh, was talking about uh, one of the um, subsidiary of Mangox at the time. Um, if you're an exchange, you just have to go through a certain number of uh, policies. And if you are a money transmitter, you need a license, or you need to work with somebody who has the license. And if you do that, then you can operate. So how is the Bitcoin economy over in Europe, and France particularly? Well, in France, in terms of users, I guess uh, it's not as bad. There's uh, some user compared to the population. There's uh, a couple of places that accept Bitcoin. Um, in terms of startup, in terms of ecosystem, that's where maybe it's lagging behind. So I think it's not a question of France. Um, it's a question about U.S., Silicon Valley against the rest of the world, I say. So there's not as many um, uh, startup funded with million dollars per uh, square kilometers, <laughs> far less. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's the problem. So it's lagging at some some uh, startups that are funded, so that there are so more employees working on that. So there are more people interested in gains momentum. It gains uh, as soon as uh, the ecosystem starts to grow and it feeds itself. So you uh, you picked up roots and went to the land of flowing seed rounds <laughs> in uh, yeah. Silicon Valley, huh? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we we raised like 1.5 million dollars in February in France, which was actually the first funding of a Bitcoin uh, company in in France. And uh, we knew that uh, if we wanted to to expand, uh, we needed to be closer to where uh, our potential partners are and closer to uh, to a potential Series A uh, if we if we were to do that. So um, we moved in in San Francisco and. It's true that uh, over there, you, um, more people need meetups, more startups funded, more potential partners, more people to meet. So, and, and you really see like a, a, a different uh, dynamism in terms of uh, an ecosystem that is already there and starting to, to grow and feed itself. So, how are the startups in San Francisco? I mean, how often are they? How many people come? Like, what's the quality of the discussion? Well, this is a, a month, a weekly uh, dev meetup which is always interesting with uh, different startups presenting their APIs, presenting their products, getting feedback from the community. And there's always a good turnaround, maybe 50 to 100 person every time with good uh, quality of speakers. And there's like a um, more social uh, uh, um, meetup group that uh, happens uh, twice a month. So, and there's one in, uh, in San Mateo with a, a hero from the Boost VC uh, Draper University. There's one in Silicon Valley. So, I think uh, there's like two meetups a week, something like that. And so, which is actually very, very good. And uh, so it's a lot of occasion to meet uh, new people in that community. What do you think of uh, Silicon Valley compared to France? Well, um, the weather is more beautiful. <laughs> the food, uh, there's no, <laughs> no cheese. No, it's not like, <laughs> the food's not good. No cheese, is yeah, that? Exactly. No, no cheese. cheese. <laughs> What's your no. favorite kind? 
Ah, bon, le traditionnel camembert en comté, c'est ce que like. <laughs> non, you cannot find them in, in San Francisco if you don't pay like uh, 20 dollars for a piece of cheese. <laughs> so yeah, I guess the price is, uh, is uh, uh, traitorous in the, in the valley compared to France for an engineer. It's like, uh, France, you can get uh, good subsidies for a good engineer. So it can be 50,000 dollars, you've got a great quality engineer. In, the, in, the, in San Francisco, you need to pay 150 or between 100 and 150 to get some great engineers. So that's a real big difference. Silicon Valley, people are really focused about working, delivering the startups. So I really like this, uh, this, um, this atmosphere and very focused about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, still the front and uh, <laughs> I still go there quite often and, uh, and the ecosystem, the startup ecosystem there is, is growing well. What are you most optimistic about when it comes to Bitcoin? Well, I'm really optimistic about Bitcoin in general. The, why? why? The, magic internet money? Yeah. Like trading these magic beans with each other? The technology, people tend to say, ah, now I like the technology and not the, the, the currency that much. Uh, I think I like both because they're both like a very uh, intimate. Um, yeah, and again, just having currencies to be able to put some contracts with, uh, without any central authority in a quick way, a versatile way. That's really the only thing. That this conceptual thing, saying that you don't need a third-party authority to be doing what you do, is just like in terms of infrastructure, it's far more like um, uh, powerful, far more fast, far more uh, cheaper. And in terms of uh, philosophy, it's like uh, just better. So yeah, from that technology, you just say like it will gain momentum. How I don't know. Uh, if is it going to be like? Uh, Bitcoin as a currency will just be a reserve currency, will be a currency for the future. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure, but I know that the underlying uh, movement behind that is uh, really exciting. Man, it's just been wonderful. Thanks for taking the time to be with us. We've had uh, Monsieur France from France, exactly. right? <laughs> Founder and head of BizDev for exactly. uh, Ledger Wallet. Uh, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate.